uh, apologies, I don't have a tie because I'm traveling now, so I don't like to have a tie when I travel. Um, the topic I was given to me for the second presentation is about uh, how we can improve the way we stimulate women. Now, you have heard yesterday that, in fact, when we start a treatment, it's not only the initiation dose which is important, it's also the dose adaptation in order to go towards individualization of the treatment. Now, what we usually do, we start stimulating patients on day two or three of the cycle and antagonist cycle, but what we should know that we can start stimulating women at any given time. The follicular recruitment, there are different theories, but the follicular recruitment, it can be through the menstrual cycle, you can have a cohort or two or three cohorts. We don't know exactly how it works, but basically you can start stimulating women at any given time. What hormones are we using for ovarian stimulation? And part of these slides you have seen yesterday from Professor Smith. We know that actually these gonotropins, they are very, very similar. If you're looking at LH, if you're looking at FSH, even if you're looking at ACG, they are very similar. They have two parts. One of them is an alpha part, and the other one is a beta part. And as you can see, the alpha part is exactly identical. There is no difference between the alpha part uh, among these hormones. But what you see is the difference in the beta part. So the amino acid number differs, but also the sequence of those amino acids differs significantly. For example, ACG has a so-called carboxyterminal peptide, the 28 amino acids, which is giving the ACG a significantly longer half-life time as compared to the LH. You have seen this slide also from Johann Smith yesterday. So the FSH molecule itself, it's not that FSH is equal to FSH. There are various isoforms of FSH. And as you can see, FSH molecule has four arms where you can add sugar residues. You might ask, what's the benefit of adding sugar residues to an FSH molecule? It's very simple because this glucolization will have an impact on the acidity of the FSH molecule. So you might again ask, what is the importance of having different acidity, acidities of the FSH molecule? Because this acidity is in direct correlation with the half lifetime and activity of the FSH molecule. So the more sugar residues you're having here, the higher is the acidity of your FSH molecule. So you can see you can go with one sugar residues, two, three, or four, and that on each of the arms. It means each of the arms can have up to four sugar residues, which could go four times four, 16. So the higher the acidity, the lower the isoelectric point, and the more sugar residues you have. Now, if you take a look at the location where these hormones are being produce the chromosomes, first of all, you see the number of sugar residues differs significantly. For example, the ACG has much more uh, sugar residues than the LH. The half-life time differs. Between FSH, LH, and ACG, the alpha chain is exactly on the same location. But if you take a look at the beta chain, you see LH and ACG are sitting exactly on the same location, but the FSH is a different location. Now, based on the acidity, as you have seen, there is also a difference in the half-life time of that particular FSH molecule. So the higher the acidity, the longer the activity of the FSH. You have heard yesterday, I think we always have to learn from nature. So what is happening in nature when you are stimulating someone does the nature use different FSH isoforms? Yes, it does. So if you take a look in nature, this is what is happening. So you have an exchange of different FSH isoforms during ovarian stimulation. Now, what we do in a natural cycle is stimulating, 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 stimulating. This is what we do. You have seen that yesterday. What is the reality in nature? High FSH and a step down. What is happening with ovulation? 
LH goes up and drops. There is still some LH activity, and if the patient is not pregnant, she will start bleeding two weeks later. In stimulated cycle, we are doing this, which is not similar to what you see here, and we usually trigger with ACG, which is not exactly what is happening there. So there are some significant differences in the follicular phase for the final oocyte maturation, but also for the luteal phase. Now, if you take a look at the number of receptors which are present in the follicles, initially we thought that small follicles do not have any LH receptors. We were wrong, because also small follicles do have some LH receptors. But what we need to know is the bigger those follicles become, the more LH receptors they have. And towards the end, actually, you have very, very few FSH receptors. And this is what I was elaborating on yesterday, that towards the end of the follicular phase, when your follicles are 15, 16 millimeters, you don't need that much of FSH. But what we are doing, we still continue pushing. And this, this is what is backfiring. So this is an important slide, because at the end of the follicular phase, those follicles, they have very, very <laughs> few FSH receptors. So what is happening, basically, you have cholesterol, which is being converted intracellular uh, through LH. Then you have estradiol being produced. Some of this estradiol is going to the systemic circulation and some of this re uh, remains uh, within their oocyte. LH, ACG, very similar. Here, not similar. So this is the carboxyterminal peptide, which is giving basically the significant difference of the LH as compared to ACG. Half-life time significantly longer. Now, what does LH do for ACG? What do they do? Of course, it's a key regulator for stereogenesis, two cell to gonotropin theory. ACG is mainly, as you know, a pregnancy hormone. But we know that ACG, partisan ovulation, oocyte embryo quality, implantation, and, and, and. If you're looking at the different products, we know, for example, that HMG contains urinary FSH. It has LH activity, but it's not LH. So it is having basically around 9.9, 10 units of ACG, which is equivalent to that. But it has almost no LH by itself. So this is important to know. Now you might ask, but ACG is a pregnancy hormone. So non-pregnant women normally do not have any ACG. Wrong. Because even non-pregnant women do have ACG. Now, if you take a look here, of course, the older women become, the higher is the ACG value. Also, men do have ACG, by the way. So the older women get, the more ACG is present. Now, if you take a look at this graph, so you have the ACG molecule. This is what LH is doing because it has a short half-life time. The ACG has a significantly longer half-life time, so it takes longer until the activity is dropping. Again, as you have seen, HMG by itself has only <coughs> ACG activity. Now, you heard yesterday, I am allergic to meta-analysis, despite the fact that I'm gonna show you one slide of meta-analysis. Demonstrating that actually there seem to be some uh, three of 3% three difference improving the outcome if you compare HMG versus FSH. Now, the main question we have to ask ourselves is how much LH is needed for stimulation? And that question can only be answered if you treat hypo hypo patients. And we know through studies conducted in hypo hypo patients that actually with 75 units of LH, you have enough. So this is what has been published. Now there is one entity of patients, the so-called poor responders or bad responders or name it how you want. So these poor responder patients have been proposed 
to have a drop of testosterone, DHES, free testosterone, and estrondion, and a steady state of sex hormone binding globally. So that means that basically there is a drop of androgens, and we know that LH or ACG help to increase also these androgen levels. So the question would have been, would those patients benefit if they would have some kind of LH activity? This is a paper by Laird. I said, look, especially in poor responder patients, there seemed to be a beneficial effect of the co-administration of LH. But as you have heard yesterday from Zion, it's a heterogeneous group and difficult to do studies on poor responders. So Peter Humaydan, a common friend of us, conducted a study, he said, look, we're gonna take really the poor responders, we're gonna suppress them with a maximum suppression, which is a long agonist treatment. So they suppressed those patients, and I said, look, we're gonna randomize the patients in two groups, a perfectly conducted randomized controlled trial to see whether the co-administration of a recombinant LH to FSH would add any benefit in those poor responder patients. So these are Escher Bologna criteria. So they put patients, as you can see, poor ovarian reserve, really poor prognosis patients. They suppressed them with the maximum suppression that you can have. So triptoralin 0.1, a long agonist treatment. They suppressed those patients. It means there was almost no endogenous LH present. And they started randomizing them one to one and stimulated RecFSH, recommend LH two to one, at a high dose, as you can see. And here, only recommend FSH. So it's a clearly conducted RCT. The idea was to demonstrate that these poor responders would benefit from the administration of recombinant LH. But if you take a look at the outcome, and the sample size, it was a good sample size. So it's 900 patients, which is not a bad sample size. And if you take a look at the outcome, you see it was in Abu Dhabi, our Indian colleagues would say same, same. <laughs> no difference. Now, what about the ACG? The ACG seems to be slightly different. Johan Smits, who is uh, present here, published this paper where they looked into the top quality embryos based on the ACG content in the systemic circulation. And they have found that actually, the higher the ACG levels on day six of stimulation, the higher the embryo quality, the better the embryo quality. And as you can see, the difference was statistically significant. And implantation rate seemed also to be significantly higher. So putting that in a graph, it seems that somehow the ACG is covering the same receptors as LH, but it's working differently. It's not exactly the same. And again, as you can see, also the life birth was directly correlated with the ACG levels measured during ovarian stimulation. You have seen that at the end of the follicular phase, there are more LH receptors present. So the idea was from our friend and colleague, Marco Filicori, to say, look, we're gonna add low dose ACG towards during the ovarian stimulation. And as you can see, they significantly reduce the consumption of FSH because ACG itself is not very expensive. It's the FSH which is expensive. So, as you can see, you significantly reduce the consumption of FSH. On the other side, pregnancy rates, it's uh, similar, duration similar, all side numbers similar. You just reduced actually the days of stimulation and the FSH consumption. Our colleague, uh, His Excellency Christophe Bloquel, who left uh, yesterday, um, he published this paper following on Filicori's paper. They said, look, what we want to do, we know that at the end, the LH receptors are more active. So instead of continuing the FSH, once the follicles reach a certain size, and we had this debate yesterday with Zion, that if you stop the FSH, the estradiol will drop. It's not true, because 
the FSH receptors towards the end of the follicular phase are not very active. It's more DLH receptors which are active. So what he did, FSH, FSH, continuous stimulation, FSH, low dose ACG from day six onwards. And if you take a look, number of all sites comparable, of course you have significantly lower FSH consumption. And if you take a look at the delivery rate per transfer, it's extremely good, extremely good. So others have done these studies and they compared it all together. And as you can see, all the studies are showing the same thing. Also, high quality oiploid blastocyst, even looking into genetics, seems to be interesting to have a further look at. Now, as you know, many studies were conducted, pharma sponsored studies looking to HMG as compared to recommended FSH. And it seemed that, especially in subgroup of patients, which are the high responders, the results were better, superior. So a study was conducted, again, sponsored by Fering. They say, look, we want to look into high responder patients, really to these patients with high um, Lamarca value or AMH value. <laughs> <laughs> so those patients were randomized to be treated with HMG or with RecFSH. And these are the inclusion criteria. So as you can see, these are really high responders. So these are really high responders which were included in that study. Again, a beautifully conducted randomized control study with limitation of bias and variables. So the question was, these are the inclusion criteria, young women, normal body mass index, high responders, and a very good sample size. What happened? These patients, they were randomized into two groups. Because they were high responders, obviously, they didn't receive a high amount of FSH. So the maximum dose was 150. It was or HMG or recombinant FSH. Dose adjustment after six days, if required. Then antagonist initiation on day six, triggering. Of course, because you're dealing with extreme high responders, you have to be cautious. You cannot trigger everyone with ACG. So there were patients who were also triggered with agonist if they fulfilled this criteria. The beauty of that study is egg retrieval. They did a biopsy and they transferred, but they didn't wait for the result. It was just to have an idea on the genetic information of that embryo. Now this results will be published in the near future. Now, one embryo was transferred and beta ACG was done 10 to 14 days later. And clinical pregnancy, ongoing pregnancy, vaginal luteal phase support. So if you take a look at HMG and recommend FSH, you see again sample size, six, over 600 patients, age, BMI, AMH, AFC, so you see really high responder patients. Number of all sites, as you can see, it was less with HMG. If you take a look at the ongoing pregnancy, this is intention to treat, and this is per protocol, you see there was always a tendency towards higher pregnancy with HMG. If you take a look at the early pregnancy loss, there seemed to be less pregnancy loss if you compare HMG as compared to recombinant FSH. And obviously, because you seem to have less number of eggs with HMG, the prevalence of OHSS was also significantly less with HMG as compared to recombinant FSH. So you see here the OHSS, early and late OHSS, it was significantly less in all subgroup of patients. And if you take a look in subgroup analysis, you see in all groups there was a better pregnancy rate. Just to finish, because I have to catch my flight, the higher the number of oocytes, the higher the number of oocytes, the better is the chance. However, it is not like we hear 15 is a magic number. It's the way you stimulate and the way you get those eggs. So if you stimulate correctly, and of course every age category has a different number of eggs required to have a successful pregnancy, it's a 
continuous thing. It's not that you start a dose and you say, I'm going to go until the end. You need to do dose adaptation according to the requirement of the patient. Dose adjustment is important. LH and ACG, as you have seen, they are very similar, but they're not identical. They cover the same receptors, but they are not identical. And this is important to know. Increasing ACG levels seem to be related to top quality of embryos, as Johan published. And we know that with the ACG towards the end of the follicular phase, once the follicles are bigger than 15 millimeters, you significantly reduce your FSH. And in fact, you don't need a lot of FSH, especially towards the end of the follicular phase. And the recent data published by Greg Witz that you have seen they clearly demonstrate that actually HMG is safe and less OHSS, less miscarriages, and seems to have a superior outcome as compared to RECFSH, especially in those high responder patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Patemi, for a nice presentation. Do we have some time for, for questions? Okay. Some questions, comments from the audience? Yes? Uh, in the American study on HMG, the last one you showed, is there any difference in the number of blastocysts available for patients? The no that's a good question. The number of eggs was less, but the number of good quality blastocysts was equal. So despite the fact that there were less number of eggs, at the end, the number of good quality blastocysts was comparable. So you see, you have more OHSS because you have more eggs, but you, what you harvest at the end is uh, the same. I thought we had a deal that you don't ask too many difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Look, we human beings, we, we like following dogmas and we like doing what we do. We don't like to go out of our comfort zone, so we just continue doing what we do. It is easy to continue the same and do the doge ad adjustment towards the end rather than say, okay, I do that and I stop and I continue. But if you ask me today, what is the ideal stimulation protocol? I think you stimulate to harvest based on the age, 14, 15, 16 eggs. And once the follicles are 14, 15 millimeters, or you stop completely the FSH, or you just give a little bit of FSH, maybe, I don't know, 75 units or whatever, and you replace it with low dose ACG, as you have seen. Why is it not daily clinical routine? I don't know. You see, it's the same question. If I go to Italy, I go to Belgium, or where I'm in Abu Dhabi, you ask me what do you do for luteal phase support, I would tell you I give vaginal progesterone. Most probably you do the same. If you go to the States, everyone is using intramuscular progesterone because their dogma is intramuscular progesterone is better because he, do it, he does it, the other one is doing it, I'm doing it also. So it's the dogma that we have, and we follow the same pattern. Is it correct? I don't think it's correct, but it's a very valid question. Thank you. Okay. But tell me, on our market, uh, if we would like to give 200 units of HCG, in what kind of shape? We have ovitriole, we have pregnil. I mean, what is the way to give it? You need the to dilute way. that. So we do that actually in our clinic. Um, the nurses have to teach patients, but you are right. Technically, it's difficult. Because, for example, the lowest dose of ACG uh, is 1,500, which is available in our country. So they have to dilute that to 200, which is not always exact. Um, most probably it would be interesting to have pen devices to have these low dose. But unfortunately, pharma companies don't make money with that. So they, they are not producing this because it's a very cheap drug, actually. We can tell the company to produce something like that if we have <laughs> evidence base. <laughs> You're absolutely right, yes. Okay, I have also my one small question. You did a nice overview of different approach to ovarian stimulation protocols, 
but I have one more idea and ask you, what do you do in kind of uh, breast cancer patients to cryopreserve oocytes? How do you perform this combination of uh, aromatase inhibitors, uh, gonotropins and antagonists if you start in the second part of the menstrual cycle? So we start them at any given time, as you mm -hmm. mentioned. Um, we administer a uh, five milligram of aromatase inhibitor, Femara, letrozole, yes. and we combine that with uh, FSH based on the ovarian response of the patient. So we- At the same time. The Go same type, but uh -huh. we try to suppress obviously the uh, estradiol production during the stimulation. And we don't wait for uh, bleeding or whatever. So at any given time, yes. we start stimulating those uh -huh. patients. And always in combination uh, with letrozole, always. Uh -huh. Thank you. Some other questions? Yes? Because in Ovitrel, one click is 250. For what 250? HCG. For? For the stimulation. Ah, this is too much, yes, because the obvious 250, it's 250 microgram, it's not units. So it is 6,500 international units. So what you see here is 200 international units of ACG. No, 200, 650, uh, 6,500 units, you can divide for 25, 26 clicks. Yes. So one click is 250 units. Yes. That's it, but you know, uh, we published a study with Papa Nicolaou in FNS 12 years ago when I was in Brussels. Um, I have my doubt whether the recombinant ACG um, is similar to urinary ACG. Um, is it the same? So we know that Ovitrel has the click pen and we know that you can do the dose adjustment. I have my doubt, it's the same like you said, urinary FSH is the same like recombinant FSH. It's not. Is recombinant ACG the same like urinary ACG? No, it's not. There have been studies looking into outcomes and based on who is sponsoring this study, you will see this outcome is better or this outcome is better. The problem is most of these studies are biased because of pharma companies behind it pushing it. My clinical experience is that recombinant ACG is not the same like urinary ACG. Even though we studied that and we published it's the same in Brussels, they were similar, but it's not exactly the same. Would I do that for patients for two reasons? No, I would not do that because recombinant ACG is significantly more expensive than the urinary ACG. Secondly, my belief, and I might be wrong, is that the urinary ACG is still slightly superior to recombinant ACG. Yes, of course, because uh, this uh, urinary, it means it's pituitary HCG, which has lower short uh, half time, so it's 20 hours. This recombinant is about 40 hours. And uh, also probably what was checked by call, but I don't know if someone can believe in this, uh, there is much more uh, hyperglycosylated ACG in urinary, which is no in recombinant. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Otilia says it's human, like human Fatemi, so. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very Have much. Have a nice flight. Thank you. <laughs> it's my pleasure to give the diploma to human Fatemi, who you could see is a unique person. He could summarize the precise evidence-based uh, way of thinking of the Brussels School originated for Pedro Roy and the huge uh, experience of Evie. Thank you to join us Thank you and please come back to Budapest Thank again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.